Hey guys, it's Jen. Welcome to my channel, Momming with Migraine. Today we are going to talk about gestational diabetes testing because I am super pregnant and I just did mine. And when I say gestational diabetes testing, it is not in the way that you think because I said no thank you to the traditional way of doing the diabetes screening and I instead went for an alternative that I thought was not only healthier for me, but also more realistic for my situation. Why in the heck would a pregnant woman say no thank you to a recommended screening? Watch the video to find out. Obligatory disclaimer, I am not your doctor. I'm not claiming to be a doctor or a nurse or someone with any training at all. Your doctor will recommend that you do this diabetes screening exactly the way that they tell you to. I cannot recommend that you go against your doctor's guidelines, ever. My recommendation here is to do your own research and decide what works best for you. I highly recommend that you clear anything that you decide on with your medical team. I am not a doctor, this is my personal experience and not medical advice. Robot, 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 robot. So, how does the gestational diabetes screening usually work? I have no freaking idea because I haven't done it. Well, I have some idea. I have enough of an idea that I knew that I didn't want to do it the way that they laid it out for me. But what I did was I watched a vlog by registered nurse RN on YouTube. She did a vlog when she was pregnant because she failed her one hour glucose tolerance test and had to go on to do a second three hour glucose tolerance test. She ended up being fine. She did not have gestational diabetes, even though she failed that first screening. This also happened to my friend just a few months ago. Interesting. Hold that in the back of your mind for later. I feel like a jerk. I should have looked at what her name was, but registered nurse RN on YouTube. She is a nurse who graduated with honors, and she has almost 2 million subscribers on YouTube, and she talks about all sorts of things, nursing and stuff. Sarah. Her name is Sarah. For the sake of this video, we are trusting what Sarah said is the normal protocol. And this also matches what I remember from what I was told as well. Here's what she said. The one hour glucose tolerance test is a test that you take usually between 24 and 28 weeks of gestation. I did mine at 27 weeks. I'm 29 weeks now. Check it out. I just wanted to do this again. The rules of the test are simple. You first fast for two hours. You go to the doctor's office, they give you a sugary drink that you need to drink within five minutes, and then the timer starts. After one hour, they do a blood draw to check your glucose levels, and they have to be below a certain number. Some places I've seen 130, some places I've seen 140. It just depends on your OB's office. But you get your results, it sounds like, typically same day or maybe the next day. If you fail this test, you have to move on to the three-hour test. That one is a little bit more involved. For this test, you fast for 10 hours instead of just two, so it's recommended that you go in in the morning. There are four blood draws total in the three-hour glucose tolerance test. The first one is fasting to check your fasting glucose level, and then you drink the same sugary drink as before. Sarah from Registered Nurse RN actually said that she thinks it's a little bit more concentrated for the three-hour test, a little bit more sugar. Once again, you have to drink that sugary drink within five minutes, and then your timer starts. You get another blood draw at one hour, two hours, and three hours after your glucose drink, and the doctor monitors what your glucose levels are doing while your body creates insulin to get rid of that sugar spike that you just gave it. I don't know what typical turnaround time is for results, but Sarah from this channel said that she got her results emailed two days later. Even though she had failed the one hour glucose tolerance test, that did not mean that she had gestational diabetes. In fact, on the three hour test, you need to have two abnormal readings in order to be diagnosed with gestational diabetes. Sounds simple enough. Why the heck would I decide to do an alternative method to this study? Thing that I'm not down for number one with the glucose tolerance test is that sugar bomb that they give you inevitably. The maximum daily sugar cap for women is 24 to 25 grams. These sugar drinks have 50 to 100 grams, depending on which drink you get. So it is literally two to four times your daily recommended healthy value of sugar as one bomb when you're fasting on an empty stomach with nothing else. It stresses me out just thinking about it. We know that high blood sugar in mom is a risk for... Oh, this sentence is difficult. I can't get this sentence out. 
We know that high blood sugar in mom is a risk for baby's development, both brain and body. That's why we do the screening in the first place. But for some patients like me, sugar is inflammatory. It's something that triggers my other health conditions and it makes me feel crappy. So I'm one of the rare people in the universe who actually stays below the daily recommended value of sugar. I know that my body gets really inflamed and I have an inappropriate stress response to high amounts of sugar. That drink would literally make me feel like crud. It's bad for me and it's bad for my kiddo and it does not in any way reflect anything that my body will go through during pregnancy or after it. It's completely unrealistic. I hope this makes sense to you the way that I'm describing it, but to me, it doesn't make sense to stress my body in a way that it is not going to be stressed in the future just to find out if hypothetically it would be able to handle that kind of stress. Why would I do that? Especially why would I do that while I'm pregnant? When we know it's bad for me and we know it's bad for the baby. Why? Especially when combined with thing I'm not down for number two. There's a really high fail rate for that one hour glucose test. 15 to 25 percent of pregnant women fail the one hour test and need to go back to do the three hour test. I'm not going to call it a money grab, but the thought did cross my mind. Why are up to 25 percent of women being spiked so badly that they are showing diabetic numbers? That's unhealthy. I realize it's only once or maybe twice if you do both tests, but to me that's unhealthy and I don't like to put my body through unnecessary stress. High fail rate, let me see if there's anything else I wanted to mention about that. Putting your body through the test is one thing, but there's also the anxiety that it brings to the mom to say, hey, uh, so you failed your diabetes screening and we're gonna need you to come in for this super long four blood draw situation sometime soon. When are you available? You make another appointment for a week or two later and then you have to wait another couple of days for your results. When you're already stressed about everything else that's going on with pregnancy, you're entering the third trimester, so you're starting to really get into that, like, nesting, everything needs to be ready because the baby's coming really soon. Like, that's certainly what I'm going through right now. The literal last thing that I need right now is to hear that I failed a gestational diabetes test. Oh, but don't worry. It doesn't mean you actually have gestational diabetes. It just means that you have to come and do an even more rigorous test. Uh, uh. I read somewhere that only 15% of women who end up going for the three hour test do end up testing positive for gestational diabetes, which leaves me wondering about the other 85%, like this registered nurse, like my friend from a couple of months ago just went through this. That is so much stress and anxiety on mom. And do I even need to mention the time sink of being at the hospital when there are so many more other important things to do in your life? And finally, Wow. And finally, thing I'm not really down for, number three, the drink itself. The drink itself has some questionable ingredients. It depends how hippy dippy you are and how clean of a diet you have, but I know that I do not respond well to preservatives and artificial flavors and honestly all sorts of other ingredients that I haven't even pinned down yet. So right now, the way my diet is, I don't eat almost anything that isn't just given to me by God. If it's not like an egg, a meat, a spice, fruit or veggie, that kind of thing, it's probably not going to make me feel very good. So I stay away from preservatives as much as I can. I stay away from anything that's processed. I cook everything, everything. And there aren't exceptions. So I'd like to read to you this list of ingredients because even for people who aren't watching all of those things as closely as I am, there are some alarming ingredients to some women. Ingredients in the glucose tolerance drink, there's dextrose, that's the sugar, citric acid, that is a preservative, artificial flavoring, sodium benzoate, another preservative, FD&C red number 40, a dye to make it red, and purified water. I'm going to go through the ingredients one by one. Dextrose, I already explained why I don't want to have that much dextrose. Citric acid is a preservative, and in its natural form, it's in lemons and limes and whatever, it's generally considered safe. However, when you industrialize it, you manufacture it in a way that is in bulk and cheap, you have to use black mold in order to do it. They do filter out the mold to give you your more pure citric acid, but some people believe that mycotoxins that the mold produce still make it into that final product and can be contaminant. I might be getting a migraine. I noticed I'm having some trouble with words right now. 
a little bit stuttery, I apologize for that. Mold and mycotoxins have been tied to respiratory illness, allergies, and even some chronic illness. Artificial flavor, I'm going to kind of plead the fifth on this one, but the hippiest of people don't like having artificial flavor because artificial, by definition, means it's something that's not natural, even though sometimes it is a naturally derived ingredient that they then make in the lab. For me, I try to avoid artificial flavor and I also avoid like spices because again I'm prone to inflammation so I try to avoid any ingredients that are like blanket ingredients where I can't pin down exactly what I'm putting into my body. Now we're gonna get to the good stuff. Sodium benzoate, the other preservative that is in this drink for pregnant women. I'm just gonna read you this quote from Healthline directly. Studies suggest that sodium benzoate may increase your risk of inflammation, oxidative stress, obesity, ADHD, and allergies. It may also convert to benzene, a potential carcinogen, but the low levels found in beverages are deemed safe. I didn't really look into the levels, but when I'm pregnant and I'm considering whether or not to have this drink, I don't really want to be Googling how much of this carcinogen is safe for me to have while I'm pregnant if there's a better alternative. And final ingredient, red number 40, FDNC red number 40, has been found to contain cancer-causing contaminants and can also and can also cause hypersensitivity reactions. I will put the link to the PubMed article down below. What really concerns me most about this test, on top of the perhaps questionable ingredients, I'm not even gonna draw a conclusion there, is that it's a blanket test that doesn't really factor in the person, their risk factors, or their lifestyle, like at all. What I've found with my experience with OBs and with pregnancy and with all of my migraine and other chronic illness stuff is that it's very tough to find doctors who will tell you, here are your options, what's the best choice for you? Rather, we're told this is the best option and it's the one that you should do. And they almost demonize you if you disagree with them. The fact of the matter is the doctor should be there to tell you what your options are. And I have not seen a lot of doctors talking about this other option for checking yourself for gestational diabetes. I'm not a doctor, so I can't call this other option legitimate, but I do recommend checking it out and seeing if it's something that you think fits your lifestyle better and might be a little bit more accurate for you as well. Here's what I did. I bought a glucometer so that I could measure my own glucose levels at home so I can see how my levels are when I'm fasting and how they trend after I have each meal. This thing was literally 30 bucks on Amazon. It's a little bit nerve wracking to prick your finger the first time, but once you realize it doesn't hurt, it doesn't really matter anymore. The kit comes with lancets, a little poker thing to put the lancet in so that you don't have to deal with the needle part. There's the test strips and you put them into the little meter. Everything's little, I'm calling everything little. They are little. And there are lots of videos on YouTube that can show you exactly how to use your glucose meter to measure your glucose at home. I will put a link to my exact meter below. I've been really happy with it, and this is actually the same meter that I've been using to measure my CSF fluid coming out of my nose. For a week, five days straight, every single morning before I ate anything, I took my fasting glucose level. That's just like at the three hour screening where you go in and the first reading that they do is your fasting. You wanna make sure that your fasting levels are under 100. Then I ate my normal meals, the normal types of meals that I have during pregnancy. One to two hours later, I would take my postprandial glucose, and depending how long it's been after the meal, you want that postprandial glucose to be below 140 or below 120, for example. The exact numbers will depend on your timing and on what your doctor recommends, what your doctor is hoping for. I did this for five days. I was logging everything I ate, everything I drank that wasn't water, and I was also writing down exactly how long it had been after the meal when I took that reading. I was even recording what I was eating after dinner so that in the morning, if my fasting glucose was high, I could see if maybe something had triggered it the night before. When I had an extra sugary meal, like a bowl of yogurt, I'm, I'm really curious. So I went ahead and measured at 15 or 30 minutes, one hour, two hours, just so that I could see what the full spike was of that glucose level, and I could really monitor exactly how high I was spiking and how long it took me to get back down to fasting levels. Five days. 
at least four readings every day, one of them being my fasting reading first thing in the morning. And the reason I love this is because I could do it in the safety and comfort of my own home. It was monitoring my body's reactions to the actual foods that I was eating. And I didn't need to expose myself to things that may or may not be great for my body. The jury's out. I'm not going to draw solid conclusions about whether or not the drink is safe. But I felt a lot more comfortable eating my normal meals and seeing how my body is responding to it. It just made so much more sense for me. I understand that the point of the glucose test, I think some places it's even called like a glucose challenge test or something, the glucose tolerance challenge. I understand that a lot of the point is to challenge your body and see what happens when it's faced with like this bomb of sugar. And that's totally fair. If I ever do have a total bomb of sugar one day, I will make sure that my glucose doesn't spike. And if it does, I will contact my midwife and let her know, hey, I had this really sugary meal. I took my glucose afterwards just to check and make sure that me and baby were safe. And it looks like my glucose is a little bit high. Would you like me to do repeat testing? I would much rather do that than put my body through the challenge for no apparent reason. I passed with flying colors, by the way. Every single one of my two hour readings was back to fasting levels. So I started measuring at one hour and my one hour readings were less than my fasting levels were supposed to be. So given my really regular diet and how strict I am on it, this was a really great way to test my glucose levels. I'm like, mm, getting weird like ear. Other people with high cranial pressure, IIH people, pseudotumor friends, do you get ear thunder sometimes? I feel like my right side leaked and now it's all plugged. Anyway, completely distracted me from whatever the heck I was saying. My glucose levels looked great. I love having the monitor here so that I can check it whenever I want. And I hope that this video helped you realize that you do have options. You do have choices that you can make. And I really encourage you to look into what those options are so that you can choose what's best for you and your health. Of course, with the help of your doctor. If you learned something today, make sure you give the video a thumbs up. Comment below with whatever the heck you want. Hit subscribe, turn on your notifications, and I'll see you guys next week. We're 29 weeks, 11 weeks to go. No, it's not twins.